Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to resume the series of videos on Martin Heidegger's Being and Time. This is a certain sense of video response to um, the requests I've gotten to continue that series. And I will focus in today's video on chapters four and the first half of chapter five. Now, because the chapters four through six in division one are exceptionally dense, but also really long. It would be kind of impossible to do justice to, um, you know, that whole set of chapters in just one video. So instead, I'm going to break it up. And today we'll focus on uh, chapters four and the first half of five. And then next video will be uh, second half of five and six. And then, of course, I also have some videos on division two coming up that really interesting stuff on death, conscience, and angst. So stay tuned for that. But I'm going to continue today with chapter four, which is called Being in the World as Being With and Being a Self, which is the chapter about the they. Now, obviously, Heidegger didn't speak English, or he didn't write this book, I should say, in English. He wrote it in German. So when we translate it into the they, that's only maybe halfway correct. In a certain sense, it certainly is what we would colloquially call they. But in a more important sense, it's also um, what we would consider to be the one. So das Mann in German is kind of the phrase you would use to talk about how we would say one does such and such. Okay, so the, the difficult thing about understanding what Heidegger means by the they is he does not mean the sort of ontic designation of all of them in the third person. That's not me. What he means rather is precisely the anonymous one who is you. You do so much of what you do according to how one does such and such. And I will get to that in the video, but just wanted to start the discussion of the they, this kind of imperfect translation of Dasman with that note. So let's start by talking about the way that in earlier parts of being in time, he already clarified that Dasein's essence is grounded in existence. And that Dasein is the only thing which really can be properly said to exist. He's kind of changing the meaning of this word existence from this type of objective metaphor we usually have of asking whether, say, Bigfoot exists or whether the Loch Ness Monster exists as this question of an object that can be made present. But for him, Dasein's existence is not the same as Bigfoot's hypothetical existence. For him, Dasein's existence is more like... Uh, Dasein having to only be itself in existence. And because Dasein is concerned about its being, Dasein's the only one that really exists. This is kind of the existentialist theme that you have in um, Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Sartre even. And for this reason, he says that when you're talking about Dasein, you make a mistake of, if you think of it, its substance as being something like a mind-body synthesis. It's really not that, okay? It's rather something which you can only talk about through this cryptic concept of existence. This is therefore what is encountered within the world as disclosed is, on the one hand, the kind of useful things which he had already devoted a lot of time in the earlier chapters of Division One of Being in Time to discussing. Um, and, you know, the useful things for work is basically uh, uh, readiness at hand is how it would be translated in a different translation than the Jones Stamba translation. So you have things ready at hand. You have equipment like hammers, and they're given in a type of referential totality of involvements with other woodworking tools. You have also the woodworking chisel, you have the set of nails, you have the wood planing and the, and the clamps and, and the woodworking bench and all that. And you discover the totality before you discover the one. It's not that you build up inductively this totality of, of relevant tools. It's rather you discover the totality and you kind of have equipment and singular as, a, as, a, as an abstraction from that. I've done a video on this in great depth. But that's not the only thing that is encountered within the world is disclosed. You also have the others, and the others are they for whom the work is being done. Okay, and the others are not merely added on to a raw object later on as a separate chunk of data is one metaphor for it. Rather, Dasein frees up non-tool type beings as also being in the world. So, in addition to this totality of equipment, you also have disclosed within the world, the others who are of a non-tool type, 
but also in the world, okay? And the others are already there with us as being in the world too. But the ontological structure of this being with is what has to be investigated because encountering others um, is also oriented, uh, orienting oneself toward one's own Dasein because the others are not everybody except me. They are precisely the others from whom one does not distinguish oneself. And the structure of with and the structure of also have to be grasped existentially, not categorically. So the they is not an object. It's not even a universal subject which hovers over all of us, which is one way of mistaking what Heidegger means by Dasman. Rather, Dasman is the who of average Dasein. So if we talk about Dasein in terms of a who rather than a what, which is kind of an earlier theme in being in time, the, the who that we're talking about with Dasein um, as the who of average Dasein or the subject of everydayness is actually Dasman. And the question, well, who is the they after all, this sort of cryptic reference which Heidegger gives of the they self, one must not confuse the perfectly legitimate, but still factical, ontic observation of, I am not alone right now, for anything like the existential notion of being with. Because even if you happen to be empirically alone at the moment, that's still being with. Okay? It's just being with in a type of deficient mode. Okay? But because Dasein has an essential structure of being with, it is encountered by others. And the others are not encountered as things, but they're encountered as at work in their own being in the world. And even when they're just maybe standing around, that does not turn them into things. Standing around is not a negation of the others encountered as being at work. It is rather just an existential mode of being in itself. Therefore, things as taken care of include food, clothing, etc. These are perfectly legitimate examples of that. But being with, in terms of concern, might be exemplified by something like a sick person. Okay? So in the one hand, you can take care of your clothing. You know, you're, you're like doing stitching work to try to make some clothing for a wedding or something. Okay? That's taken care of. But when you have a sick person, you're not taking care of stuff. You're rather concerned about somebody who is still someone you're with, okay? Therefore, concern can be distinguished from care in that even if you have the example of leaping in for the other to do his job for him, you're taking care away from that person rather than maybe treating that person as a thing taken care of, okay? So care and concern is kind of a distinction that's important in division one being in time, because being towards others is ontologically different from being towards objectively present things. In fact, being with is not even the sum total of several co-occurring subjects. It's not just that you have each individual subject given initially as a type of independent substance. And then being with is just the secondary set which you build up from them inductively. Rather, being with is a lot more fundamental than that in terms of Dasein considered existentially rather than in terms of category. So circumspection is the term which deals with taking care of things, as I mentioned in the uh, second video in the series on being in time. But when you're dealing with others, you're dealing not so much with taking care as you're dealing with tolerance and not so much with circumspection as considerateness. Okay? Therefore, ontologically, Dasein is being with is for the sake of others. But ontically, Dasein might turn away from the others, but will still remain in the mode of being with. And the others are always already disclosed in their Dasein, okay? But the others are first heedful in the world of things rather than disclosed as these unattached subjects, okay? So in being absorbed in the world of taking care and being with, Dasein finds somehow that's not really itself and that somebody has taken over. And the question is, well, who has really taken over in this absorption? And the, the answer to that is really the they, the they has taken over. Because defined existentially in terms of certain ways to be, you have this realization that 
certain things that you're absorbed with are things which are done according to the way that one does them. For example, here in India, one drinks tea at a stand in India in a certain way, like the men in the picture show you. And when I'm here in India, that's how I do it too, okay? When in India, one eats with one's hands, like so. These are all things which are not something that the third person they does and you don't. No, those are things which when you're absorbed in you know, your world, those are exactly the things that you do. And what happens is that Dasein loses itself in they. Existentially, being with others turns into this lagging behind and catching up, which has this character of a distantiality. And Dasein loses itself at the whims of others in this distancing. But the others in this case are not definite, de definite objective entities, okay? nor is the who even a sum total of all of them. It's rather just the neuter Dasman. In activities of his own example, like riding the bus, uh, reading the newspaper, every other is like the next. We even have fun when we're not maybe working and explicitly trying to relax. We even have fun the way that one does or that they do. And this averageness is the existential character of the they. It's a kind of a leveling down of all possibilities. But at the same time, Dasman takes away Dasein's responsibility because this publicness controls interpretation. And as fundamental as interpretation is, for Dasman to kind of take away the responsibility of it in a sense that Dasman is always right, Dasman's interpretation of how things are to be done is always right, in this type of everydayness, most things actually end up happening as a no one in particular did it. And they, therefore, disburdens Dasein of its own being. And for authenticity becomes a legitimate problem, the same way that it was a problem for someone like Kierkegaard. The authentic self must find itself out of its being dispersed in the they self. Authentically being oneself is not reaching some type of exceptional state of the subject nor is it even reaching a state of detachment from the they. Rather, authentic being it is an existential modification of the they as an essential existential. Therefore, Dasein has to be understood as something like a rewriting of Kierkegaard's own notion of this problem, which he phrased in terms of maybe the individual and the crowd. For Kierkegaard, this, there's this distinction between falling into the idle chatter of the crowd versus making a leap of faith, which nobody else can really do for you. Because if you are to own up to the problem of being an individual for which the truth that solves that problem is not going to come to the crowd all at once, it's going to have to come to the individual. For Kierkegaard, that is in terms of kind of a leap of faith out of lostness in the crowd. And Heidegger is certainly going to provide something like a rewrite of that. But of course, that will largely occur in Division 2 in the context of death, conscience, and angst. For the moment, we'll move on to Chapter 5, being in as such, which Heidegger talks about rather than fall into the traditional metaphysical error of deriving everything from some primordial ground. Heidegger rather emphasizes the equiprimordiality equi of the constitutive factors of Dasein. Dasein's fundamental structures for Heidegger need not be grounded in substance, for substance is just a secondary abstraction from, ultimately, from care. Therefore, he's not doing the same thing as, as um, Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, not doing the same thing as Aristotle in the ancient era, not doing the same thing as Descartes and Spinoza in the Renaissance. He's rather looking for a way to bring into phenomenal relief the unitary primordial structure of Dasein's being by which its possibilities are ontologically determined rather than building up this set of categories grounded in substance. And for him, the essential relations of being together with the world in terms of maybe taking care of things, in terms of maybe the concern of being with, in terms of maybe being oneself in, with regard to the problem of the who. These are things which Heidegger emphasizes that Dasein as a unitary rather than a composite object is the only way you're going to understand this stuff. Because Dasein 
is not something that could be put back together from the pieces and from a blueprint, as though you could even get access to such a blueprint. Because in reality, we have neither the cement nor even the schema to restore Dasein from its many fragments, even if we had them. And this is because Dasein is, it's there. And the big emphasis Heidegger makes in this chapter on Dasein being it's there in terms of the Lichtum, the clearing, in terms of disclosure, that's going to be really the big emphasis, really one of the most important parts of the whole book is going to be right in this chapter. It says that because Dasein is not an objective piece of the clearing, nor even the sum total of all the objects within it, Dasein has to be understood to therefore be its clearing, because Dasein can only be revealed in a clearing. But this clearing is not is is certainly, I should say, not disclosed by any other being, because Dasein disclosed it itself. And if Dasein is its clearing, its nature as existence implies a certain concern about being its own there. And chapter five is going to be about this disclosed there, which is illustrated through the metaphor of a clearing in the woods, rather than the metaphor of a definite object like a Rubik's cube. Therefore, there are two equal primordial ways to be the there. He's interested in attunement and also in understanding. But you have to understand that both are equal primordially determined by what he calls discourse, although what he means by discourse is a little bit different from what you might normally think. So we'll start with attunement. He says, like, obviously there are psychological moods, okay? And you can do a psychological study of moods, but that's the ontic study of mood. Attunement is ontological. And in fact, a psychology of moods is legitimate only as considered to be founded upon the fundamental existential attunement of Dasein, which is prior to it and provides the very possibility to do this type of psychological empirical study of mood. This is because Dasein does not have to explicitly enter into a mood. Dasein is always already in a mood. Even when Dasein seems to lack a mood, this is not nothing. It's just Dasein in the mood of being tired of itself with its being manifested now as a burden. Likewise, Dasein fundamentally is its there by finding itself in thrownness into its there. This is one of the big themes in um, existentialism is there is a type of thrownness in which you, f you find yourself, for example, not necessarily for Heidegger, for any existentialist, you already find yourself in a certain sense thrown into a certain historical moment. You already find yourself thrown into a certain uh, situation, context, um, conditions of life which you did not choose, okay? And Heidegger has an answer for this in Being in Time. And he says that in terms of mood, Dasein does not find itself in this type of self-perception that turns itself into an object of investigation and perception. Rather, Dasein, if it's going to find itself, it's going to find itself in attunement, okay? And Therefore, moods are an enigma which cannot be compared to one solvable through the type of apodictic theoretical cognition favored in Western philosophy, even up to the point of Husserlian phenomenology. Husserlian phenomenology still is this quest for this essential intuition into these structures with a priori validity, which you cannot sort of kind of move beyond because they're foundational. But Heidegger says that moods are not that type of puzzle. Even overcoming a mood does, result, does not result, I should say, in no mood at all. It rather is going to come through a counter mood. And even when Dasein is in a bad mood, Dasein becomes blind to itself. Its world of heedfulness is veiled. And the circumspection of taking care of things is led astray. But the funny thing is that mood does not come from without, nor even does mood come from within. Rather, mood arises from being in the world as a mode of that being. As already disclosed, the mood therefore makes possible later directing oneself towards something. You can only do that on the basis of having this mood already disclosed, right? Therefore, attunement provides submission to the world as that out of which things can matter. And mood's relation to objectivity is therefore going to be a little bit strange because in a certain sense, Dasein encounters things in heedful circumspection. Even the objective per perception of staring at things with an eye to their explicit sense contents can only happen because things matter 
to Dasein, but that mattering is grounded in an attunement and to Dasein's openness in the world. So things are never just there. They have a certain thereness grounded in attunement because Dasein already is, in a certain sense, within a mood. And the things are going to matter to Dasein out of that attunement. Okay? Therefore, the world as disclosed in moods is never the same on a given day. But this quest after, quest after theoretical cognition kind of flattens the world down from its attunement into a type of leveling down. And fear has to be understood, therefore, as a mode of attunement, more so than a type of empirical psychological mood. And we're afraid precisely before something encountered within the world. But only a being concerned about its being can be afraid, because fearing discloses Dasein as being left to itself. And even if you say, well, no, I'm afraid about a particular object like my house and my things which might get stolen, that's not a valid counterexample, because Dasein is initially in terms of what is taken care of. Therefore, understanding, and I'll just make sure that this is working real quick. Therefore, understanding. Okay, and there's some sure comments. I'll get to those at the end. Thank you so much. Um, understanding has to be understood a little bit differently because attunement and understanding are equal primordial existential structures. And yet, understanding is always attuned, and attunement always has its understanding. Okay. This is why we're not in Heidegger so much doing like the hierarchy as this rather emphasis on equal primordiality, right? Understanding in this context deals with Dasein's potentiality of being itself for its own sake. Something ontically, uh, excuse me, sometimes ontically understanding might mean being able to do something. You might say something like, I have a pretty good understanding of blacksmithing. Like I understand blacksmithing pretty well. But as an existential, understanding as being able to exist is what really matters. Because Dasein is always what it can be. Dasein existential, existentially is being possible. But as surrendered to thrownness, Dasein has lost itself and must find itself again in its possibilities. Therefore, we have to talk about projection because project is existential structure of understanding. This does not mean following an explicitly inscribed plan. Rather, Dasein has always already projected itself and already understands itself in terms of its possibilities. Projecting possibilities does not mean that understanding thematically grasps those possibilities as some intended content. Rather, projecting throws possibility before itself precisely as a possibility. Therefore, Dasein, strangely enough, is constantly more than what it is. And understanding is faced with the choice of being authentic or inauthentic. The authentic is what originates from its own self. And that is going to be the big challenge in Division 2 with facing up to death and taking hold of it out of the distortion which the they self provides. Therefore, you have to talk about sight. Obviously, the history of Western philosophy is in a certain sense a history of ways of theorizing about sight, which is in itself redundant because theoria in ancient Greek precisely is a word related to sight. And the sight of Dasein is something you can't talk about, but it's existentially constituted by understanding in its character as project. This is because a site primarily and as a whole related to existence is transparency. Because site is primordially letting things be accessible to it, to be encountered in themselves, sorry about that, um, without concealment. All site, therefore, is primarily based on understanding. And Dasein, therefore, is incompatible in a certain sense with the kind of project that Husserl hoped for in earlier phenomenology in that Husserlian phenomenology in Save the Ideas is the hope to gain essential intuition in which the essences can show themselves without obfuscation. You suspend the natural attitude and you do these other methods in order to try to let the essences be given in intuition with a type of a priori purity. But for Heidegger, the essences are not so much purified a priori givens, 
so much as they're intuitive on the basis of this understanding. You can only do that type of search for in purified intuition if you already are doing it on the basis of Dasein's understanding. Okay, Therefore, in, in understanding, Dasein projects its being upon possibilities. But being towards possibilities is what it understands. Therefore, projective disclosure of possibilities kind of negates the traditional model of perception. And that is where I will cut off with chapter five and next video we'll do the rest of chapter five and six. So let me just see traditional model of the comments here. So Adam, thank you for the comments, says, if we assert that Dasein is something that is revealed when confronted with death, then how is it different than the concept of an individual, that which is deprived of any collective identity, considering that Dasein, if it um, finds it itself in Dasman as something differentiated. Um, okay, hey, thanks for that question. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. How can we say that um, it's different from the concept of an individual in Kierkegaard, I assume you're talking about? Well, the first thing that I would say about that is Kierkegaard is interested in the question of a subject, okay? Kierkegaard still basically is a Cartesian thinker, okay? Um, and he talks in um, uh, Sickness Unto Death, for example, about the way that a subject is this type of synthesis, okay? Um, what you get from these type of lower, um, uh, what's the right word? You, you have these, uh, he, it's, like a, it's like a Hegelian appropriation. It's, it's the synthesis of these other contradictory things, okay? So for Kierkegaard, you do have a subject as um, uh, synthesis of body and another type of mental type of stuff, right? And that's relevant in a certain, up to a certain point to Dasein, but it breaks down when you realize that Dasein cannot be equated with life. Dasein cannot be equated with person. Dasein cannot be equated with even subject, because this is an anti-Cartesian book. And Heidegger says early on that you're um, maybe not incorrect to designate what you would normally talk about as a living sort of consciousness as Dasein. You're not incorrect if you identify that it is Dasein, but you are incorrect if you say that Dasein can be defined by that concept, okay? So that would be my response to how Dasein is not really individual, okay? Luke says, what do you think of Hubert Dreyfus' interpretation of Heidegger? Do you have any thoughts about his ideas about AI? Hey, that's a great question. I would say that a lot of my own interpretation to this day probably still owes something to Hubert Dreyfus because he was the first person I ever learned being in time from back in 2010, long before there was anything on YouTube. You had to go to iTunes U for um, online stuff on being in time. And um, actually John David Ebert mentioned in, in, in some interview that he started his channel for the same reason. He was looking for stuff on, I guess, being in time I guess the same time I was, like 2010, and there was nothing on YouTube. Um, I think back in those days, there was like a few short videos of Heidegger speaking in German, which is which is awesome, don't get me wrong. But at that time, Hubert Dreyfus um, filled the vacuum of knowledge on online by providing um, just the lectures from his Berkeley courses, and there's a lot of good stuff there. But I think he maybe overemphasizes the computer part in the same way that um, Jordan Peterson mentions in Map of, Maps of Meaning that even something as objective as neuroscience, um, which is not philosophy, that's like supposed to be an empirical science, is done differently in the West than it is in Russia. In Russia, you have more of this emphasis on the sort of communist Marxist understanding of understanding the brain in terms of what it does in this type of metaphor of labor. Whereas in the West, we have more of this understanding of the brain in terms of how can we find the algorithm by which the brain as a machine processes data. And that is the way that the people at MIT were trying to understand the subject, both the literal subject in neuroscience and the figurative subject is that they were replicating with the artificial intelligence. But Dreyfus, admirably enough, broke from that to say, well, no, Heidegger's shown us that the, the subject, if, if that's what you call it, isn't a computer that processes data. There's all of this stuff in Dasein that is simply incompatible with the model of a machine that comes into a room and linearly takes in bits of content and processes it according to an algorithm. And I will give 
Dreyfus credit for that, but I think he might overemphasize his that argument because his audience at MIT and then his audience at Berkeley in, in the sense that the other sort of analytic professors at Berkeley might be the kind of people you need to overemphasize that. But I don't think that Heidegger was explicitly writing all of being in time just with this concern about how is this not a machine, okay? So Adam says, are you familiar with Alexander um, Dugan, I think in French, who uses the concept of Dasein as the subject of his theory of fourth political theory. Um, I'll admit, I don't know who that is, and I don't know what fourth political theory as opposed to first, second, and third means. But thank you for mentioning, I realize every day that I'm on YouTube, especially um, with you know this uh, um, correspondence with you guys, just, just how many things are out there that I haven't read and that I don't know about. So thank you for mentioning this stuff. But I think my wife is calling me, looks like lunch is ready, I just had, first day of class teaching children at the age of like eight years old and younger. I thought I was teaching middle school. It's actually more like elementary school. Some of the children are very young and they all had trouble understanding my American accent. So for all of my viewers in places that are not America, I'm sorry for my accent being, you know, my, my accent is weird even within America. Even when I lived in Illinois, people from Chicago would say, you talk with kind of a funny accent. I can't even tell where you're from. So sorry for that. But anyway, I just taught students and looks like my wife has made some lunch. So I'm going to go ahead and get some lunch. So thank you guys. And I'll look forward to more videos on being in time.